Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and are you tired of your job? Here's what we've got for you today. The co-author of the book, The Nine Lies About Work, Ashley Goodall. Plus, in our headline segment, a new report is out from the Federal Reserve showing how Americans fare when it comes to retirement savings. We'll share the details. Plus, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener and save time for my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who love the benefits that come with this job, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Moms, donuts, and baked goods. Are you kidding me? Welcome to another day in the basement. I'm Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Just so you know which voice is which. Across the card table from me, ready to tackle a Wednesday. It's my good friend, OG. This is the definition of friends with benefits. Oh. Right? You and me are friends. We have some benefits that together. We we, to- we get the benefits of all mom's Benef- baked goods. Benefit of podcasting together, holding hands. Lots of benefits. Treats whenever we want. Mm-hmm. I wasn't quite sure where you're going with that one, but I like it. I like it. Great way to start your Wednesday. You know what else is a great way to start your Wednesday, OG? Ashley Goodall coming down to the basement. He and uh, Marcus Buckingham co-wrote a uh, piece for the Harvard uh, Business Review. Never heard of it. No. Little tiny publication. That it costs up- so much money to get that magazine. It does. But you know what? Every time I've picked one up, like at the airport for what, 30 bucks? $42. Yeah. It is worth it. I always like, get. Okay, fine. It's good. Yeah. I always get great stuff and I read yeah. it once every other year. However, great piece by them, which became a book. And Ashley's coming down to the basement to talk about it today. But first, you know what makes me excited about working anywhere is when I have extra money in my pocket. And thanks to Magnify Money, you can have extra money in your pocket because the average person who goes there saves $450 on better financial products. So whether it's a better credit card, paying less interest to the man by refinancing your debt, getting those student loans taken care of, whatever it might be, better savings account, checking account, it's all there at magnifymoney.com. And we're brought to you today by Clear. Thanks to Clear for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Clear uses your eyes and fingertips instead of traditional ID documents to get you through security faster at airports and stadiums. Get your first two months of Clear free by going to clearme.com forward slash SB2019 and use promo code SB 2019. The show hasn't even hardly started. We've gotten you two free months of clear, gotten you where you want to go faster, and we saved you $450. Gotcha through security and gave you 400 bucks. It Pretty is good deal. incredibly amazing. But that's just the beginning. Friends we, with benefits. Oh, man. Stop it. We got a lot going on here, so let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from NAPA-NET. That's the National Association of Plan Advisors, the people that run 401ks and pension plans hang out here. And this is written by Ted Godbout. Apparently, OG, the Federal Reserve has a new study out looking at Americans' finances and how we're feeling. I'm guessing it's very insightful. It is very insightful. Uh, A large majority of individuals say they're comfortable financially, it says, But Mm -hmm. many also report they're struggling to save for retirement, according to the Federal Reserve Board. In its latest report on the economic well-being of U.S. households, the Fed found that most measures of economic well-being and financial resilience in 2018 were similar to those in 2017, with 75 percent of adults saying they're doing okay or living comfortably, up 12 percentage points from 2013. I'm going to stop right there. During a time like this. My first thought when I think about this, I think about those, what are those Aesop's fables or whatever, where you've got the squirrels that are saving nuts for winter or right. building their house a brick, or whichever one you want to use. Those are pigs. Oh, those are pigs. Ahead. Yes. But you know, the point, if we're all feeling great, this is the time to make hay because we all know that winter is coming to quote this little show that nobody knows anything about. Never heard of that either. Uh-uh. Yeah. It's always interesting 
to kind of think the other way and just as a as an exercise to play the what if game, you know, what happens if I have a 20 percent reduction in pay next year? Maybe I don't get my bonus. Maybe I don't get a pay raise. Maybe I have to take a demotion to keep my job because the economy doesn't go as strongly or my company doesn't do as well or whatever. That's why it's so dangerous when you get those discretionary compensation things to spend them, to consume them, because it's very difficult to go backwards in time with your consumption. It's it's very unpleasant. It's funny. I remember it, working early in business. I always had great ideas for this business I worked for. And my mentor slash boss stopped me one day and she said, it isn't that this isn't a good idea. It's that you won't be able to undo this stuff. And you also get rid of some of the, the spontaneity of work. And I think it's the same thing with expenses that once you decide, hey, I'm going to do this subscription for X thing, getting rid of that subscription is a pain in the ass. Well, and that's an easy example. I'd say the harder one is things are going great, so I'm going to go lease a Lexus. Right. Yeah, much bigger. And I know it's 1200 bucks, and it's probably really stupid, but it's a, my dream car, and it's awesome. And, oh, crap, now I don't have a job, or my bonus isn't as much, and my freaking car payment's $15,000 a year. You know, so. Did you see the headline about Hertz? We did a story on it on our Money with Friends show about how Hertz is allowing people to drive. You can almost drive any car you want. You can switch twice a month, never own a car, and it's only $1,000 a month. Yeah, I did see that. That's for the low, low fee. (laughs) I was thinking that. I was like, wait a second. Maybe there's an alternative to having this $200 car payment. I should get a $1,000 car payment, then I can drive anything. And think about when you change that. Right. When you change that, now I have to find a down payment for a car, but I've been spending a thousand dollars a month, which could have been going toward a car. I mean, how many months until your crossover point that you can buy a halfway decent car, but even even a brand new car, which is, you know, something that. uh, Well, and you're upside down if you've got a new one to begin with and all that sort of stuff. It's just it's very slippery. You know, once you get past the point of needing money to, like, get a better lifestyle. And people have different thoughts on where that number is. It's probably somewhere in the 80,000 range, you know, from 80 to 150,000 in my estimation is when you're starting to add some luxuries. Maybe you spend a little bit more time going out to eat or a little bit more time on vacation, a little bit better vacation, whatever the case may be. Once you get past that 80,000 mark, it's much more discretionary consumption. And if you consume all of that immediately, then you don't give yourself any wiggle room. You don't give yourself any margin of safety in case something doesn't go exactly the same next year. The economy is strong. Companies are doing well. So you're getting big bonuses or bigger maybe than normal. Now's probably the time to be hanging on to a little bit of that. Further down the article, it says a sizable percentage of people in the study report they have no savings. And even those who do have some, many say they lack financial knowledge and are uncomfortable making investment decisions. Why do we always read this? That people always say, I'm very uncomfortable making financial decisions. And yet you look at the size of any, not not just our podcast, but any financial podcast audience. It doesn't look like people are seeking this out. Oh, you're saying, you're saying there's lots of people who still need help. This piece says there are lots of people that say, They feel uncomfortable making financial decisions and they wish they had more financial education. And yet the stats around our show and our friends shows, bigger pockets, money, how to money, Farnoosh is so money, her money with Gene Chatsky, her money matters. Anything about money, money with friends, any of of these shows, our money, their money, you look at the size of their audience, OG, and the stats prove otherwise. People say, oh, I don't have enough education. It it sure doesn't look like you're trying to get it. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's not fun. (laughs) You know, (laughs) you want somebody to come in and go, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Uh, You should take part of this and not touch it for a really long time. But it's really fun to go to Disney. It's really fun to go on vacation. I don't know. Making it fun to nerd out about term versus whole life insurance. That's where it's at right there. That is super cool. Yes. Uh, Those with self-directed retirement savings accounts, nearly 7 in 10 non-retired adults, must make decisions about how the money is invested, but most lack confidence. 
according to the findings, six in 10 non-retirees who hold these accounts, like a 401k or an IRA, have little or no comfort managing their investments, six out of 10. Mm -hmm. In addition, self-assessed comfort and financial decision-making may or may not correlate with actual knowledge about how to do so, the report emphasizes. On average, respondents answer fewer than three out of five financial literacy questions correctly with lower scores among those who are less comfortable managing their retirement savings. Not good. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with not knowing how to do it. There is something wrong with not knowing how to do it and not doing anything about it. There's lots of different ways to deal with that. But one of the ways could be to gather some more information and educate yourself a little bit around a specific topic, whether it's, you know, retirement savings or your 401k or investment allocation or something like that, just to, you know, it's that 1% every day type of thing. If you just make a little bit of progress, it's not trying to get to how do I become a chartered financial analyst? You know, it's, it's how I make 1% better decision today with my money. I like how that recent Jeopardy champion learned about different topics. He would look at these introductory books written for kindergartners, first graders, second graders, and he would get in that way because he found that those books presented things in a much more interesting way. Like they weren't as analytical but he could then get excited about the topic, right? Instead hmm. of, I, I think sometimes people try to go really deep on a topic and all of a sudden they're talking over their head. I remember I had a philosophy class once and I thought, oh, I can probably handle this. And they went into like deep Plato philosophy. In, in Don't eat Plato. That's my philosophy. Do not eat Plato. That's what they were saying. And I didn't get it because they were using big words like do not consume Plato. Yeah. Or uh, Latin. But <laughs> Platus, uh, no eaterus del Plato. Yucky in yuck, el moutho. Yucky eye is o disgusting o. <laughs> I think that's pig Latin. That's not real ice cream o. <laughs> no matter what your daughter says, o. <laughs> that isn't what you think it is, right? But it was only class in college that I got halfway through the first class, and I was like, I'm over my head. See ya. But I feel like that may be the case. People start off with this 301, right? Yeah. And instead of going to the pieces that they find interesting, what what interested you first in finance? Like, what was the thing that really got you excited about it? The money part. <laughs> Buying a big house. Yeah. Well, the interest that I had in finance, I think, came two ways. One was my parents were not particularly good with money. And when I was very young, 11... I started making a boatload of it for an 11 year old, about 300 bucks a month. And my mom took me to the bank and I was standing in line reading the stuff that was there. And there was a Franklin Templeton mutual fund seller there. And I kind of looked in that office and I said, I just want to put my money in that thing. And my mom tried to talk me out of it. And the lady basically walk my mom through how, no, if this money is for college or if it's for longer term, it's going to go up and down, but, you know, should grow to be more than what the bank would offer, but maybe you do a little bit of both. And I had Franklin Templeton growth and income fund when I was 11 years old. And, um, you know, that's how I got started in it. And then I worked at a bank for a while in college and I got tired of people coming to the window going, Hey, I've got $80,000. I want to put it in my, you know, CD. I want to open a CD at 0.9% or something like that, or 2.6% or whatever the interest rates were at the time. And I remember thinking there has to be a better place for this money than, than this. Yeah. And, uh, and off I went. I saw the movie Wall Street. I mean, I was kind of interested before then. We You're had like a Gordon Gecko. I am in. <laughs> that is me. Preach, brother. If I could go to prison. <laughs> Blue horseshoe loves Anacott Steel. You're like, I just want to say that. If I if I could get three square meals a day, enough to pay for anything. Three hots and a cot, baby. <laughs> I I but before that, it was my junior year in high school. We followed some stocks and I thought that was pretty interesting. And then and then Wall Street. But then after that, I remember watching these morning television shows and these people that had all the little secrets about how to, you know, even out your utility bills or not get ripped off at the grocery store. And I thought, that's brilliant. That is fantastic. So when I had the opportunity to move into financial services, I was like, oh, this would be great. And immediately, the firm that I started with, we were selling permanent life insurance and, and mutual funds with high fees. 
There you go. And well, like, to be fair, there were there weren't any other kind of fees. There that's were just true. fees. Yes. It's not like you had an option. No, no. But I learned very, very quickly about how life uh, about how life worked mm-hmm. and what was what was right and wrong. But once again, it started with a movie for me. Obviously. What does obviously mean? It means your life is a movie. Like everything you do revolves around movies. Isn't this a movie? Isn't this like the Truman Show? All the world's show? a stage. Yeah. And all the men and women, merely players. Isn't that the name of that movie? The Truman Show? Uh, our second headline comes to us from the New York Post. This is written by Allison Sadler. This is sad. Three in five American adults do not have a... Will. Will. Yeah. Uh, do we need to read any of this? The research <laughs> examining if and how people plan for their later years and the extent to which they've discussed the future with their partners or family members found that many are taking a head-in-the-sand approach, which always works, by the way. I find that if I just ignore the stuff, it gets better. Well, I think that we have a really well-thought-out estate plan, and we took a long time on it. And a lot of the stuff that we were talking about on Monday about being intentional around you know, the verbiage and that sort of thing, we spent a lot of time on that. And uh, my wife was in my office, and she says, what's in that binder up there? And I'm like, uh... That's the estate plan. And she says, what's in it? What does it say? And oh I'm like, my goodness. holy cow. <laughs> I guess we ought to talk about it again, you know. But, which which uh, is a good point, by the way, reviewing it every few yeah. years. Making- I mean, it took us probably two years after we had our third kid to put the third kid in there. The survey of 2,000 Americans conducted by one poll on behalf of Brookdale Senior Living revealed that two in five have not spoken to their children about their future plans at all, and others haven't given their future financials any thought either. Yeah. Well, and that's always a tough thing, too, right, is to, you know, talk to your kids. I have young kids, so I can't comment on how it's like to talk to adult kids, but talk to your kids about, okay, here's how much money we have, and... Here's what we want to have happen to it and that sort of thing, because you don't want to give them, you know, let's say that you do have a whole bunch of money, right? You don't want to give your kids a false sense of security because if you're a normal retiree, it's going to take you 30 years to get through retirement or 40. So a lot can happen in that 40 year period. You don't want to tell your kids, Hey, I got a million bucks. They they sit back and go, sweet. I don't have to do anything. Dad's got a million, you know, and then you consume it all. And then your kids are hosed. But at some point in time, you have to, right? I mean, you just have to talk to somebody about it. Well, at least I kind of like uh, I'm the uh, contingent trustee for a family member. What I like that he did, because he's a very private person, he just told me, oh, gee, exactly where everything is. He hasn't told me what it is, but he's told me exactly where it is. So at the very least, he still has his privacy but yeah. b- but when something happens to him, I know exactly where to look. He gave me this one sheet of paper that said, go here, go here. This is this. This is the thing here. And uh, on two occasions, he's updated that for me, which has been great. Yeah. But at the very least, just get it done. I mean, now that there's even free places online. I mean, you and I talked about with the Tom Petty estate, having somebody do it is great. Let, let's not let perfect be the enemy. Just do it. I mean, places like tomorrow will do it for free. Get, well, here's the thing. Get it done. You have an estate plan. Th- well, that's true too. Your state gives you one for free upon residency. <laughs> and, and upon passing away in that state, you get to follow that state's estate plan, which may not be the same way you want to do it. For example, your state may say, if you have children, the money goes to them equally if you don't have a spouse. Well, you may look at it and say, but I don't want to do that. State that you live in may say, we don't care. That's the rule. Or it may say, if your kids are over the age of 18, they get a big check. And you may say, but I don't want to give my 20-year-old a big giant check of all my money. Like, that's really stupid. I should space it out. State says, yeah, we don't care. You have to override the default assumptions. So in some cases, the state plan is adequate. But probably in 95% of the cases, it's not. Before we get to our lesson, one lesson that took me a long time to know is uh, don't deal with banks that don't have your best interest at heart. And you can tell they don't have your best interest at heart when the fees are high, the uh, rate of return they give you is low. Looking at you, Bank of America, that took me forever to get away from. And finally, when I did, I was so happy that, that I did it. And you know what? A great resource to do that is with Magnify Money, because what you'll find when you go to Magnify Money 
is just how bad your bank might stink. And the cool thing about a resource like Magnify Money is that not only is it the number one place to compare and contrast 92% of all the stuff that's out there, but second, they also have a fantastic blog led by, formerly with uh, Yahoo Finance, Mandy Woodruff. And Mandy and the team do a fantastic job of telling you exactly how different financial products work. And then the site itself is a phenomenal resource, the number one resource on the internet, which is why we're glad that we partner with them. So check it out yourself. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money for more when you're ready to compare, ditch, switch, and save. I think our takeaways here, OG, is number one, just get the estate plan done. I think that one's succinct. And then the second one is financial education. Don't feel like you're up for it. If you're listening to the show, I think you're doing just fine. If you have friends, though, that need more financial education, maybe tell them to try making it a little more fun. Making it more fun, I think, is a good entry point into the world of money. Ashley Goodall is upstairs talking to mom. He is a senior vice president in leadership and team intelligence at this little company, OG, called Cisco Systems. You familiar with, with them at all? Yeah, never heard of them. They yeah. uh, make uh, car batteries, right? He, <laughs> maybe. I, th- I think they make the batteries that make the internet work. I think. Oh, that, internet batteries. Got it. I, think yeah. I knew it was batteries of some kind. Yes, I think that's that's it. Although Ashley might put it a different way. Ashley's super passionate about how organizations work and uh, why organizations don't work and how to turn them around. And he's the co-author of a book called The Nine Lies About Work, a free thinking leader's guide to the real world uh, from Harvard Business Review Press. And uh, he's written some fantastic pieces that have appeared in the Harvard Business Review. The Feedback Fallacy is one and reinventing performance management. If anybody knows how to talk about making your life at work better, and by the way, is a guy that can make this topic so fun. We talked about that a second ago. It's Ashley Goodall coming down to the basement. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, Ashley Goodall. How are you, man? Hey, Joe. Good to see you. Good to find you down here. Well, it is. It is dimly lit for a reason, though. I have a face for radio. How did you and Marcus, your co-author, Marcus Buckingham, how did you two meet? We met years and years ago when I asked him to do an event at Deloitte. And the evening before, we sat down in the bar and got to know one another and talked for, I think, four and a half hours, which was probably a bad idea, given that we both had stuff to do the next day. And that conversation has continued ever since, essentially. I mean, we we found a lot to talk about. We found sort of common interest in making the world of work better by figuring out how to design it for the humans who actually live in it. And you guys bring completely different, but very complementary skills to the book and to your work. Tell me about both of your backgrounds. So Marcus's background is as a researcher. He's somebody who's always been fascinated by how do you measure something you can't count? which, by the way, we could spend a whole podcast talking about how you measure stuff you can't count. It's a sort of fascinating and super important thing in the world. My background has uh, always been big organizations. I'm fascinated by the complexity and the messiness of an enormous organization. Cisco has now 72,000 people globally, and that's where I live right now. We both speak one another's languages, of course. I do research as well. Marcus is no stranger to big organizations, but but we both sort of have a particular door we walk through. And then when we meet in the service of how do you how do you find people at work? Because we seem to have overlooked them. That's That's always been a really productive combination for us. How did the two of you get involved and get interested in the lies about work? Yeah, um, we started off in 2015. The Harvard Business Review asked us to write an article about the performance appraisal. And of course, as as, um, as I say that, listeners feel their shoulders sort of go down a little <laughs> bit and the performance <laughs> appraisal, really, that was... That was the magnificent thing that got you guys going together. But of course, the reason our shoulders sag is it's the thing we love to hate. And certainly back at the time, many, many organizations were asking themselves, could we do it differently? 
we sort of took a different look by saying, what's the evidence? And by the way, before even what's the evidence, what's the right question? And the question wasn't so much how should we review people, but how do you help people thrive at work? And the evidence on how you help people thrive led us in a very different direction. HBR said they loved the piece. Um, lots of people read it and got lots of uh, attention and I think helped to change the conversation. So the folks at HBR came back to us a little bit later and said, OK, could you take the same approach? Marcus Evidence, Data, Ashley, Real World in the big organization, put the two things together, ask the right questions. Could you apply that to the whole world of work? And we said for a while, we said, no, we're busy. And then we sort of worked our way around to it. And in the end, that germ of an idea turned into nine things that we wanted to talk about in the world of work. And we start the book with a lovely quote from Mark Twain, which is, it's, it's not what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And in a way, Nine Lies About Work is nine things about work that we know for sure that just ain't so. I want to dig into at least two of those as as we talk. But without going too far into this, I was jumping on a plane, grabbed the Harbor Business Review, the most uh, recent uh, copy, and you're in there now again. Yeah, we were uh, talking about feedback, which is one of the things that uh, <laughs> one of the things we talk about in the book. And probably also another one of these things that makes our shoulders sag a little bit if I say to you, hey, Joe, I've just been chatting to your mom upstairs and I, boy, have I got some feedback for you. Oh, good. Then there's a little part of your brain that wants to exit the basement as fast as possible and get as far away from me as possible, as quickly as possible. And that's a problem because in the world of work, we think that giving people constructive, critical feedback is our most important tool to help them do better at work. And again, you look at the evidence, just ain't so. When it comes to feedback, and this wasn't one that I wanted to cover, but while we're on that, I always think, and am I like the average person, I always think, if you tell me you want to give me feedback, I'm going to completely ignore the first thing you say, because that's supposed to soften me up. I'm going to listen probably too intensely to the second thing you say, and then I'm going to uh, completely forget the third thing that you say to try to lighten it up again. Because you're in a traumatic shock because of the second thing I said, right? Because right, right. you, what you're saying is that's the... There's a name for this thing. It's called the feedback sandwich, which is a sort of coining that says, oh, this stuff is so unpleasant that we've got to surround it with lots of goodness. <laughs> and somehow if I, I can trick you into listening to the bit in the middle, um, the real problem with that is that when you get to the bit in the middle and you're trying to listen, but really it's an unpleasant experience. So firstly, your brain isn't primed for learning. And secondly, the content of the bit in the middle is generally about something that you did wrong or badly, according to me, by the way, and I'm not the authority on you. So I'm saying you did this wrong. The sadness of the whole thing is that what that means is critical feedback, constructive feedback is a mistake fixing tool. But you can't use a mistake fixing tool as an excellence making tool because they're completely different things. If I want to help you be great, the raw ingredient of great performance is actually performance that's already good. So what I need to do to help you grow is to say, hey, that thing you just did, that was great. What was going on in your head? What were you thinking? Where, where could you use that more? How can I reflect to you my experience of something that you did that's beautiful and well done and, and, and the potential of something much greater? And how can I help you figure out how you can build on it? Now, you know, every time we say that, people come back and go, yes, but isn't mistake fixing? Are you saying we shouldn't fix mistakes? And of course, the answer is no, we need to fix mistakes. But we shouldn't delude ourselves into thinking that by the time we've fixed every mistake in our organizations, we've created anything that's fine and strong and excellent because that's just the wrong approach. It's funny you say that. I just finished reading a book called 5 a.m. Fifth Avenue which is about the making of the classic movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. And I thought after that, Ashley, about my role even here in the basement with our, with our, with our minions that put the, the podcast together, this idea of being a director. Blake Edwards got so much out of Audrey Hepburn because it was very collaborative. And I'm kind of hearing that in your discussion about feedback as well, that being much more collaborative – to bring something great to our audience and thinking about the audience first and how can I help this person 
bring out the best of them is really maybe a better approach than just more stick all the time. Yeah, and much more humble as well. There's a certain arrogance, by the way, just to call it out. There's a certain arrogance for me to say to you, you did it poorly. Who am I the judge of that? Or even even more strangely, you did it well. Who uh, I'm now the judge of excellence. What I should say from a perspective of humility is here's my reaction to what you did. Bad or good? You lost me in the middle of that question. Okay, that's not that you asked it badly. It's that you lost me. It's my truth. It's more humble. Or, of course, on the on the upside, gosh, that thing you said really moved me or you really caught my attention here. So, yes, to collaboration. Collaboration, I think, comes from a posture where where people are equal partners. And that's threatened when one person oversteps the line and says, listen, I have some right to divine the truth of you and I'm going to tell you what it is. And as soon as you think I'm going to tell you the truth of you, we're back to the feedback sandwich again and your brain leaves the room. And by the way, there's all sorts of interesting science on what happens to a brain when you tell it it's about to be judged. And it goes into flight, fight or flight mode and it stops learning at a, at a neurochemical level. It's funny because I'm sure people are thinking the same thing I was thinking when I went into this rabbit hole that you and I didn't even intend to talk about. What does this have to do with money? And I think about how often with your planning partners, whether it's your spouse or whatever, you know, one person's strong on this, Ashley, the other person's not. I see people give people feedback about how they spent money or what they did with money. And it's, it's very, very relevant, but I don't want to go there. I want to talk actually about lie number one, because you and Marcus hit us in the face with lie number one. And the lie is this people care which company they work for. Why is that a lie? It's a lie because when you try and measure experience in a company, you find it varies more within a company than between companies. Okay, that's the measurement finding, if you like. Now, what does that mean? It means if the right unit of analysis, if you like, is the company, then we should have different experiences at different companies. And therefore, we would care which one we worked at because we'd be getting a different experience there. But in fact, when you look closely, you find out that experiences vary inside a company more than they do from one company to the next. And so you have to say, well, uh, I should care about where my experience is great or where my experience is horrible. And actually, the, un the right unit to think about isn't the company. It's the team within the company. And the evidence tells us that being on a great team is much more important than the company that contains that team, if you like. The data point that we discovered at Cisco when we started researching this is if I move you from a great team at Cisco to a horrible team at Cisco, as measured by the engagement of that team, your chance of walking out the door increases by 45%. Holy moly. So you're nearly half as likely again to quit if within one company, within one company, I change your local experience. I change the people you work with every day. So it's actually true that we care which company we join because from the outside, we can't see the teams. We don't know what that on the ground level experience is going to be like. But once we're in the door, we care which team we're on. We care whether we stay with that team. We care whether that team makes us productive. We care whether that team sees who we are and can make that useful and leans into that. And that, it turns out, is the most important experience of work. You and Marcus write extensively about culture, and I can hear the exasperation in your writing when you talk about companies emphasizing culture all the time. A lot of companies talk about culture as a signal that they're interested in the experience of work, which one shouldn't criticize. We should have more and more companies interested in the experience of work. The question is, how do you take that energy and take that intent and point it in a useful direction. And the idea of culture is very broad. And certainly if you're a team leader in a company, very abstract. If your company says to you, please build a culture of innovation, you sort of kind of know what to do, but you sort of kind of, and, 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 okay, does the, how should I talk to Joe then if we're in a culture of innovation? How should that change my daily interactions? On the other hand, if you understand what characterizes the best teams, and we talk about this in the book, one of the things that characterizes the best teams, for example, is you would have the sensation if you're on my team that you were getting to play to your strengths every day at work. 
And so now we can have a different conversation because you can say, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of kind of getting to play my strengths, in which case I can go, great, what energizes you? What are your strengths? What do you run towards? And then you can tell me. And then I can go, all right, can we think of three places next week where you could volunteer those strengths given your knowledge of the work? All of a sudden, that conversation is super, super practical. We can do something about it in a way that the signaling things of, of culture are much less tangible for people trying to improve the experience of work. And, and by the way, when you realize that teams are the most important, not the only, but the most important place to look, what it means is that team leaders are the most important people in building an experience of work at a company. So a, a lot of the focus of what we've written is how do you help people be great team leaders? Because that's the only way a company can build great teams. Well, and I also thought it from our our individual's point of view who are listening, Ashley, that don't lead teams. If you're frustrated with your work, like we've gotten letters from people saying, listen, I'm thinking about quitting my job because I'm frustrated with work. Maybe it's just about finding another team at the same company. Uh, that's always the first place to look. And you can ask around and you can find out which team leaders have great reputations and which who are the team leaders that people really, really want to work for. And that's a really good sign. And of course, if you stay within a company, you're typically bringing with you the network that you've established and the reputation that you have. So that's always a smart place to look. And the other thing to think about if you find yourself struggling at work is, OK, what are my strengths? And I don't mean by that. What am I good at? I mean, what am I energized by? What do I run towards? What are the activities I look forward to? Can I explain to somebody else what those are? Most of us, sadly, are very astute when it comes to our weaknesses, the things that drain us. And we can talk about weaknesses at great, great, great length. And it, it's called ranting, by the way. Um, <laughs> but but we we neglect our strengths. We don't push hard into where do I derive the greatest joy? Which work activities fill me up? Which which things at work would I do whether I was paid to do them or not? And the only person who can ever answer that question about you is you. I can't look at you across the dimly lit basement and go, I know what energizes you, Joe, because I can't see inside your head. So, in fact, probably the most important piece of career advice for anyone is get super articulate about what energizes you at work and then go tell people about it. And that might sound sort of weird and boastful. But again, if it's energy, there's a way of doing it, sort of volunteering. You go to a team leader and you go, look, I really like finding patterns in data. I love that. Um, could I do that anymore? Does anyone else need me to look at data for them? I'd love to be doing more and more of that. And no one's ever going to say, no, you can't, or that's not useful. And if you do that lots and consistently, over time, actually, the content of your job changes to match what energizes you. So you don't so much find a job that plays to your strengths, you make one by being articulate about what it is that you're drawn to. You tell some great stories about actually the opposite of this. You had a woman named Lisa in the story, obviously, probably not her real name, and frustrating how she spent her whole life, or not her whole life, she spent a ton of time researching company, making sure it had, quote, the right culture, ends up the boss that she ended up working for. She ended up on the wrong team, illustrating everything that you're talking about. What's funny is when I was at American Express, I saw exactly what you're talking about, Ashley, because when I first when you first started talking, I thought, well, in a big company, how can I go? You know, I could go around telling everybody what I want to do, but there's all these predefined positions. And then I remember a woman I knew named Lisa at American Express who actually created a brand new role because she brought to her leader it, the entire profit and loss statement about why we needed this and how she would make her job pay for itself in a short amount of time. She actually created a whole new position, even though she was working for a Fortune 100 company. When you survey Americans about, do you have the ability to change the content of your job? More or less three quarters of people will say, yes, I have the wherewithal. I have the control over what can, what my job contains. I can change that over time. 
But then when you ask people, do you get to play to your strengths every day at work? The answer seems to be stuck at about 16 yeah. percent. So we see the opportunity, but we don't know how to act on it. And we're saddled with the results. And sometimes it's create a new job. But more often, it's actually infuse the things that you love into the job that you have by asking the people around you, hey, could I do more of this? And I've always found, you know, there's an exercise you can do with a team where you just sit in a circle or whatever and you, you go around and you say, what's one thing everybody would like to do more of? You get halfway around the circle and somebody said something, I'd like to do more of this. And someone else chimes in and goes, oh, my God, I hate that. Can I give that to you? And now all of a sudden we've lessened somebody's load of weakness, things that weaken them, and we've amped up somebody else's load of, of strengths, which brings us, by the way, back to the team. The magic of teams is that they can offset differing people's strengths and loves and loads and balance that in the service of getting something done together. If you're by yourself, it's very hard to do that. But as soon as you're with a team who knows you, who knows where to pull on you, a team can actually make weirdness useful because our strengths are weird to everybody else. They're not weird to us because we spend our whole time with us, but they're pretty weird to other people. Teams are magic because they take that weirdness and meld it into something that's useful for everybody and that allows us to do things that none of us could do alone. Well, that brings up another lie I want to get to here in, a, in just a second, and I'm running out of time. But I want to put a point on this for everybody listening, because, Ashley, the stuff that you're talking about, you know, when I started running marathons 10 years ago, I had never run a marathon before, and we moved across the country. My new friends all ran marathons, and then I became a marathoner also. It was it was who I was around. And you look at how the team, how the people you around can so change everything. I had a mentor early in my career who talked about avoiding clusters of misery, that there are these people at every organization that he called clusters of misery to just stay away from that group of people and you're going to be good. And what's funny is once he identified those people, I could see myself then navigating my ship away from those and toward people that empowered me every day. But well, I yeah, and, and we think companies are homes at work. No, teams are homes at work. Teams are where we are home or not because it's the people we're with most of the time. I want to talk about one other thing later in the book that you you brought in, and it's about being weird. And I thought that this was great. People talk a lot about work-life balance, but you say that work-life balance is a lie. Yeah. Firstly, you look at the categories and you say, well, surely life does actually contain work. They aren't two separate bits of my day. I, I am alive at work, whether I feel alive or not. Um, but the... The presumption, of course, is that everything in the work category is bad and everything in the life category is good. And so we've got to balance them out. So you get a little bit of sugar to help the medicine go down, if you like. And that's the solution. But you look at that for a second and you go, well, hang on. There are things at work that lift me up. Not everything, but there are things there that I love doing or that I run towards. And by the way, there are things at life. There are things in the life bucket that drag me down a little bit. And so the, we've got the categories wrong. And then, of course, we're, we're talking about how do you balance them? Well, balance is a precarious state. If you ever had everything balanced in your life, I think the one thought you'd have is nobody move. Because if anybody moves, I'll tip, we'll, we'll lose the precarious balance. It's a prescription for, for stasis, if you like. Whereas all that we know about health is health is motion and health is process. So, in fact, when you look, there are things at work that you love and things that you loathe. There are things in life that you love and things that you loathe. And a more useful prescription, I think, is not to think about work-life balance, but to think about love, loathe, imbalance. And how do we imbalance those two things more and more and more wherever we are roaming, if you like, in our lives? I love that idea. Let's get as imbalanced as possible for the win. The book is called The Nine Lies About Work. I could talk about this for about 47 hours, but instead we'll let people go to the book at this point because you talk about everything. Uh, one of my favorite chapters is about planning. I love how you talk about General McChrystal and how he runs meetings differently. I found that fascinating. I also, you know, any chapter you start off with George Clooney references and Notions 11 is also pretty fun by me. Where do people get the book, Ashley? You can get it at Amazon.com. You can get it at Barnes & Noble or anywhere books are sold. 
Yeah, good stuff. And we'll link to it in our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Ashley, thanks for hanging out with me for a few minutes and talking about the lies about work. Thanks, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome to today's trivia extravaganza. I'll have that in a minute, but first, a little glimpse into the life of a podcasting superstar. Today, we're celebrating Superman Day by performing some, well, frankly, outright impressive feats, like daring each other to eat even more bacon without getting acid reflux in 30 minutes. (laughs) That one's a killer. Or who can carry a loaded box of Joe's Mom's 8-track tapes down the stairs without dropping any? You know, like Superman dude stuff. The kind of stuff Clark Kent probably would have done. In fact, I'm pretty sure he definitely did do that stuff. But mostly, on Superman Day, we asked amazing Superman trivia. Like this little specimen. What is the name of the comic book series that first introduced the world to Superman? I'll have your answer right after this. Well, thanks to Clear for supporting Stacking Benjamins. If you've never heard of Clear, you are in luck because Clear uses your eyes and fingertips instead of traditional ID documents to get you through security faster at airports and stadiums. That'll help you reduce some stress because Clear gets you through security with just the tap of your finger. You can get to your gate faster and settle down, not have all of that pre-flight stress. I, I remember before I even had TSA pre-check, a few flights thinking I'm not going to make it. Now what's bad is that even with pre-check just last week, as that line continues to get longer, I look over that clear line and I'm like, Oh geez, completely got something here. You are your ID clear replaces the need for physical ID cards using your eyes and fingertips to get you through security because you're the best ID out there provides access to airports and stadiums. Clear also helps you get through security faster in 40 plus airports and stadiums across the country. More being added every day. There's family plans. If you're traveling with your family, you can add up to three adult family members at a discounted rate and kids under 18. Well, they go free. If you've listened to all to this show, you know how OG has used clear over and over and over and over. I'm getting clear myself here in the next couple of weeks because I'm tired of hearing OG talk about how quickly he gets through security and just eliminates that entire process. It's so easy. Right now, Stacky Benjamin's listeners get their first two months of clear for free by heading to clearme.com forward slash SB2019 and using promo code SB2019. Once again, that's C-L-E-A-R-M-E dot com slash SB2019. Then put in promo code SB2019 for your free two months of clear. Welcome back, telephone booth clothing changers. Wait, is that just me? Pretty sure everybody... Eh, it's probably just me. Anyway, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and welcome back to my trivia. Here was today's superhero-themed question. What was the name of the comic book series that first introduced the world to Superman? The answer... If you said Superman, well, thanks for playing the odds, but wrong. Also, if you said Marvel, yeah, Superman's a DC character, losers. We're going to have to take away your nerd badge for that one. The answer, it was Action Comics. The Comic Lines publisher was originally known as National Allied Publications, then as National Comics Publications and National Periodical Publications, before finally settling later on the name of DC Comics. Wait, hey, what's that? God, what is that delicious fragrance coming from upstairs? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, God, no. That cannot be what I think it is. Oh. I feel my willpower draining. I must resist. It's too strong. Oh, God, Joe's mom's peach cobbler gets me every time. Oh, I love, I just, I, oh. All right, I'd love to stay in chat, but this, this is my kryptonite, folks. See ya. Big thanks to Ashley Goodall for stopping by. You know, OG, this idea about team leaders we have the best team leader in mom. You, you can't get a better team leader than mom. I can do without the uh, 6 a.m. team meetings, but, you know, 
that 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 part is bad, especially for you. But the uh, nonstop baked goods and the and the you boys can do anything approach. Go team! We Absolutely. have to put our hands in, and then we have like a little <laughs> one, two, three, go. Absolutely love that. Hey, let's throw out David Lifeline. OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends over at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. And Laura in our Facebook group, the Basement Facebook group, uh, she told us what she values most, and that is Heat and Buffalo Trace Bourbon Cream. Okay. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Well, I heard it was bourbon, so I guess that's not bad. I don't <laughs> yeah, know what the rest of it is. That's the first thing I thought. I'm like, hey, there's there's bourbon. Well, we'll certainly, Laura, make your time with loved ones much better because their answer at Haven Life is your loved ones and your time. And that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple, although bourbon might not make it as simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Their application is super simple and it's online. You get an instant coverage decision. And of course, they're backed by an over 160 year old insurer named Mass Mutual. Today, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Eric. Say hi, Eric. Hey, Joe and OG. Greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, have some quick questions about retirement accounts. Give you a little background first about my situation. Recently changed jobs. I went from being a W-2 employee with a small company to working with family. They pay me about $60,000 per year on a 1099 MSC. So at my previous employer, as like I said, it was a small company. They had a simple IRA set up for me. I contributed to that. Um, after I left that job, I transferred that simple IRA to a regular IRA at Vanguard, which is also where I contribute to a Roth IRA. My wife and I both make about 150000 per year. My wife contributes about 15% of her income to her 401k, and we both max out the Roth IRA. As I was doing my taxes this year, TurboTax suggested doing a SEP account. Um, just wondering, can I do a Roth IRA plus something such as a SEP? Uh, or is there something better I should be looking at? I'd like to keep it with Vanguard. So interested in your thoughts and if there is an even better option. Thanks for that question, Eric. I think we have a fairly straightforward answer for you. Yeah, right. The um, first thing that I want you to be aware of is uh, you mentioned that you're getting paid as a 1099, some family member, you know, you're working at the family company or something. Just take a moment and make sure that that is correct. Not that you're not getting paid correctly, but that it's correct that they're paying you 1099 versus W-2. Every state's a little different in their definition of that, but you really want to be aware of, well, the people who own the company, I guess, want to be aware of the differences between an employee and a contractor. The benefit, of course, to you by being an employee as opposed to a contractor is that you don't have to withhold the money necessary for your own FICA taxes. So remember to do your quarterly estimates, which I'm sure you are. As it relates to the retirement plan, there's a couple of options for self-employed folks. The uh, first one that you mentioned, the SEP IRA, self-employed pension is what it stands for. That is an eligible contribution that you can make as an employer to your employee, which is a weird way to think about it. But as a 1099 employee, you are a contractor of your own employer company. So it's kind of weird to think about. But at the end of the year, you can figure out how much you're eligible to contribute, which will be approximately 25% of your net income after expenses. And uh, of course, TurboTax, as you mentioned, would be able to help you calculate that as well. You have until your tax filing deadline to put that money in. So you can kind of accumulate it throughout the year. And then if you're not sure what the number is, you know, and you do your taxes in March, you can sit down and figure it out and put the money in. Uh, it's qualified plan, so it's pre-tax. You'll get a little bit of a tax deduction, and the money grows tax-deferred, and you take it out. It's fully taxable, so it works just like a 401k, just like your simple IRA. If you want to contribute more money than that, you might look at a solo 401k plan, which allows you to defer the full 19000 plus give yourself a company match. So if you're in the mood to set aside, let's say, $25,000, $30,000, you would be able to do that 
within a uh, solo plan, whereas in a SEP plan, you are only eligible for 25% of your profits. So there's a little bit of difference in terms of the contribution limits there. If you're trying to max it out, then you might go the solo route. If you're content with roughly about 25% of it, then the SEP is going to be much, much, much easier, as a matter of fact. And Vanguard's fine. Yeah, great stuff there. Very, <laughs> as always, I, is what you meant to say. Well, well, and I always do worry about these family businesses that are trying to control costs and uh, and go, oh, I got an idea. We'll just make them independent contractors, even though they're not. Yeah. I'm working with a hiring company right now for a project that I'm on. And this person who is helping me with it was like, hey, it sounds like you need a part-time contractor, but since you live in Texas, you need to talk to an employment lawyer to make sure that this person is, in fact, a contractor and not a part-time W-2 employee. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I didn't even think to get that deep into it. But it turns out the IRS is real particular about who pays them when. <laughs> so, <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah, it's, it's BS if you ask me, but whatever. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Eric. We also are finishing off the bottom of this uh, basket of letters, and we have one here from Sue. Sue says, what are your thoughts on indexed annuities with annual resets? And yes, I attended a dinner slash pitch. I'm 63. Have about $1.3 million with some in thrift savings and the rest in IRAs. Paid off house, exchange traded funds, CDs, savings checking accounts. Still working for the government with a salary of $130,000. I'd like to retire at 65 think I should roll over some money from the thrift, but to where? Love the show. Thanks. Sue, we also have, um, well, a couple uh, fairly easy answers for you here. What do you think about the indexed annuity with the annual resets first? Uh, It quite often doesn't work the way that your dinner seminar presenter probably illustrated it. The correct way to think about an index annuity is that it is 100% a fixed account. All the language that they use is, hey, it's tied to the market. You know, you'll hear things that say it goes up, it never goes down. You get a portion of the stock market growth. And while it's kind of true, it's not entirely accurate. The way that we approach them, and we have very few in my business, but but the way that we approach them is we use them exclusively as a fixed income component in the overall financial plan. So if you are using it as, a, as an equity component, if you're looking at it as, hey, this gives me market returns with no risk, that's not a fair way to approach that. And anybody who suggests that that's the case is not entirely accurate as well. You will not get market returns. You will get 20% of the market returns or 30% of the market returns, which after costs and accounting for the fact that sometimes you'll get a zero, works out to be probably close to 2 to 3% a year. So if you use the assumption of 2 to 3% a year and you want to replace your fixed income portion of your portfolio with an income stream, this would be an adequate way to do it. Traditionally, what makes the annuities at this capacity interesting is the stream of income that it provides. Yeah. You know, an annuity is supposed to be something that turns into a stream of income. That's kind of how they all started a long time ago. That's why I'm not a fan is specifically, Sue, for you, because you work for the government, and then I'm assuming that you have a pension, an annuity is to build a piece of the puzzle that you already have, which is this lifetime income stream that you can't outlive. So with a government pension, do you think an annuity makes much sense? Well, probably not. But I've also seen them used for, you know, it also depends on the dollar amount, but I've also seen it used for an application of a specific thing. So let's say, for example, that you also have in your financial plan, $5,000 a year premium payment for your long-term care insurance. And you want to make that go away, right? You just, you just say, I, I don't want to see that. I, I just, I just want to make the payment. Well, an idea would be to take a portion of your investment portfolio. So in this case, she says that she has a million and a half dollars or something like that. So you say, you can ask the annuity company, how much money do I have to set aside today so that you'll pay me $5,000 a year for the rest of my life? And they can calculate that. And they say it's uh, $61,000 today. Boom, you take $61,000, you put it in an account, it pays out $5,000 a year, you in turn pay that to your long-term care policy, 
you've taken care of a specific expense for your entire lifetime with this tool. So I, I kind of like it in that approach. If you don't have a pension or it's modest, I like it in that approach. But you have to remember that it's unlikely that that number is going to grow over time. So if you're using it for a specific expense, let's say you want to say, I want to take care of my housing expenses, which is our taxes, insurance, and upkeep. And I want that specific money set aside for the rest of my life. You have to round up because in all likelihood, that annuity payment's not going to go up every year, whereas your taxes and your insurance and your upkeep are going to go up every year. So if that payment right now, those three things are you know, $5,000 a year in that example, I might not have my annuity payout 5,000. I might have a payout 8,000 and be banking the other three, knowing that eventually I'm going to have to use that for my house stuff. So there's specific purpose, but I think how they're sold is generally as a replacement for equities when it's definitely not a replacement for equities. Not at all. It's fixed income in a different bucket. Yeah, not not at all. And there's a few companies doing a good job of that, but by and large, still, I'd say 90% of that industry is frustrating to us because an annuity can be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's horrible it, yeah. in most applications. Yeah, there's some out there that are doing well. And um, there's just the, the sales stuff that goes into it is kind of blah as well. You know, there's a lot of manipulation that goes on. Yeah. There's a, well, no, you know what? I'm not going to nerd out about that today. We'll do that some other day. We will tackle that on another episode. I like it. All yeah. Right. Yeah. But thanks, Sue, for that question. I got one more thing to add real quick for Sue, because she said that she wanted to roll some money out of her TSP. I'm so which, glad you brought that up too, because I yeah. almost stepped over Which, which of course you can. After 59 and a half, you can do that. But I don't know that you need to. You know, once you're over 59 and a half, your TSP slash IRA work very similarly to one another. Both will require distributions at 70 and a half under the present law. Both have the option to invest in different investments. And as you know, by being an employee in the TSP, it's fairly simple. You've got CSI, F, and G, right? And then a couple of target date funds, but they're still pretty low cost. So a lot of people who have TSPs like them because of their simplicity so don't think that just because you're retiring or just because you're over 59 that you have to do something. I guess that's the message that I want to leave you with. You don't. Yeah, it's one of the best run retirement plans in the United States. Weird to say that the government runs one of the best plans, but they totally do. It's it's fantastic. Well, and the reason that I think it's one of the best isn't because of its profoundly awesome investment platform right. or its or its website Right. Or any of that sort. Of, they made it very simple. Super For the longest simple. time, you get five things to pick from, you know, which I think helps. Right. But they're you all, can do this, 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 or this. But they're all quality options. And I was going to say, and they kept the cost very, very, very low. Yeah. For those five things. So they don't overwhelm you. You got a one in five chance of getting it right you know, in terms <laughs> of your allocation. So, uh, yeah, totally, totally agree. Thanks for the question, Sue. You've got a question for us, uh, head to the Haven Lifeline at stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail for that. And that will get you a Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt, which we're very excited about. Brad makes uh, great stuff. And by the way, speaking of that, more to come on Brad's latest design, Doug uh, 2020. Doug's going to be doing some interesting things on top of- Is he going to do a writing campaign? Uh, to, we, 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 well, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, trying to make the debates now. Not sure what debate, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll figure that out. That's going to do I'd it. love to see him go toe to toe with Bernie. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to do with that. So we're just going to move on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, log, all of them. Log not pause. Just, I'm not picking on Bernie. I'm picking on all of them. <laughs> I can all go with you guys, Doug. We have... One thing to ask of you, and that is if you could leave us a review of the show, it sure helps people find out what they're getting into when they listen to the Stacky Benjamin Show. This one mom has on her fridge from Zero Emission. Impressive interviews of various guest speakers. I'm amazed at the quality of the guest speakers and Joe's interview skills, where he asks in-depth questions about the guest books or business ventures. I also appreciate the witty banner between Len OG and Paula. I like how OG can read the financial news headlines and remain calm and stay focused and not easily swayed by background noise. I, he, you do a much better job of that than I do. 
by far. Love the cerebral effect of listening to your podcast during my long work commutes. Reminds me of the car talk show with muffler sounds and all. Thanks for that zero emission. Uh, Mom is very, very proud of us and showing that to the bridge group when they come over today. That's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Sure thing, Joe. Hop on my back. I'll tell everybody what we should have learned today. First, take some advice from Ashley Goodall. Worried about your work culture? Focus on your team, not the big, huge company. Turns out, culture is the people you have lunch with every day and work together with on projects. Second, retirement planning? We need some help. If you're behind, you can't go back and make up for lost time, but you can start today on building your future. But the big lesson? Joe's mom's peach cobbler? Yeah, it's gone. Oh, I crushed that thing. So gone. (laughs) It never stood a chance. Big thanks to Ashley Goodall for joining us today. You'll find his book, The Nine Lies About Work, wherever books are sold. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor Doug, and I do not like computer jokes, not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. We were going to record an after show, but there's an interesting discussion. Some of the discussions that OG and I have when we're not recording are pretty damn interesting. And this one. We so were, we think. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we think we're brilliant when we're not recording. Then the recorder comes on and surprise, surprise. But this is uh, we happen to have the recorder running and uh, we were talking about uh, the Perot Museum and mm-hmm. Ross Perot. The uh, Perot Museum has a ton of stuff from Ross Perot, but it's all only for family. So they did a new story on it. He has tons of shit, tons and tons of cool ass Americana. I've heard that's a great museum. Well, the Perot Museum is more for kids, but yeah. uh, no, no, no. In I mean, but just as a kids' museum, it's a good yeah. museum. I've never been there. The kids have been. They like mm-hmm. it. But then there's a whole section dedicated to all his stuff, like his stuff when he was running for president both times, like war memorabilia. He's got Osama bin Laden's cane. Does he really? Yeah. He said the Delta guys brought it home to him because he was such a supporter of the military and special forces and stuff. You know, he's a Texarkana guy. Oh, yeah? That's cool. Yeah, he grew up in Texarkana. And there's actually... That's the hometown pride right there. Yeah. So the Perot Theater is the theater in town, which is funny because I thought that the Perot Theater was named after Ross Perot in Texarkana. When I first moved there, I'm like, what an egotistical, you know, you don't know something about somebody, they're wealthy, you're like, oh, they just, dude probably has just a monster ego. Nope, not the case at all. Mm. It was this old theater and it had been run down and so they got to the point where they were playing like dollar movies and the theater was just all beat up. He bought it for next to nothing, restored it, donated it to the city only if they would name it after his parents. 
totally change my, my I'm like, yeah, yeah, not the not the story that I had in mind at first at all. And he gives tons of money to stuff around Texarkana. But anyway, our running group was running by his house. That that little three room apartment that we lived in over mm-hmm. Uncle Jack's garage was right down the road from his childhood home. And two two stories about Ross Perot's house. First one is so it's this little house, but it has a uh, beautiful porch on the front of it with a swing. We were running one day and it was kind of cold, but there's a woman, and by cold, I mean it's in the mid 50s. But there's a woman sitting out there, very still with a newspaper, and she's sitting on that swing. So our big group of runners was always, you know, 15 of us. And my friend Hal, who you've met, Hal said, said, That's Ross Perot's house. And I said, well, I know Malcolm told me last time we ran by here, he told me all about it. And he said, he said, yeah, Ross Perot's family there. In fact, they have a statue of a woman that, that they put out there. That's his, that's a statue of his mom. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And we run by it and everybody in the whole group kept their cool for maybe like 10 minutes until I said again, later on, I'm like, that's really cool that they had the statue out there. He's, he's like, dude, that was just a woman reading the paper <laughs> on the porch. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Joe Gullible. But the second story about that house is my friend Mike took me by the house just before we moved and told me another story. We're driving by the car and we slow down. And he said, look at the brickwork of the stairway leading up to the house. Versus the bricks on the house. Look at how the bricks in the house on the house look a lot newer. And they do. And he said, here's what happened. They were all the same bricks. But Ross Perot, after his family moved on, made the house available for a while for families that came to town. And then later on for people that, that were in town. And he would have this whole thing where people could apply to live there. And then finally, he sold the house. And when he sold the house, the people took those bricks and they painted them white. You know, people will paint over Mm -hmm. the brickwork sometimes. Perot got so mad. And this is all, by the way, a secondhand story. So I don't know how much of it's true. Perot got so mad that he offered to pay them nearly twice what he had sold it to them for. Because he did not want the house he grew up in with these white bricks. Didn't like it at all. So he buys the house back and he tries to have them power wash it out. And of course, as anybody who's tried to do that knows, it won't power wash. So he has them take the house apart and turn the bricks, turn the bricks completely around. So it sounds like something exactly a rich person would do. Yes. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what I said to Mike. Had him turn like, around. So I have, I have, I have all the money in the world. Uh, I like the house is built. I don't like the color. Rather than repainting it, why don't we turn the bricks around the other way? We'll turn the bricks around so it looks the way that it used to look. And it does. And the only way you know that it's the inside of the brick that was always protected from the elements is that the bricks look newer than the bricks newer. coming up to it. It's pretty, pretty well. Probably not true, but great story. <laughs>